Okay. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Paul Usowitz with Community Credit Counselors, and I want to welcome you to our webinar, Borrowing Basics, uh, by the Money Smart Program. Um, and we certainly are glad that you all could take the time to join us today. Uh, just basically, what to give you an idea of what we're going to do on the agenda is um, we're just going to go through and, and talk about some borrowing basics. This seminar is slated for an hour, but I should be done in you know much less than that time, uh, about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, hopefully. So, all right, some ground rules. Uh, there's no real ground rules, to be honest with you. We just appreciate you being here today. Feel free to take notes. We're going to have some fun, and um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, again, my name is Paul Usowitz. I'm the pre I'm the bankruptcy counseling director here. Just to give you a little bit of my background here at Community Credit Counselors, I've been with the company since 2005. I've been in the credit counseling industry uh, since 2001. And uh, I've seen a lot of different things in my experience here. Used a lot of these same principles myself personally uh, to uh, to handle my finances and my debt. So they work. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. And again, basically, uh, the objectives of today. Um, we're going to by the end of the session, you're going to be able to define what credit is and what a loan is. And um, you're also going to be able to, secondly, distinguish between secured and unsecured loans. Thirdly, you're going to identify the three types of loans. Fourth, we're going to, you're going to be able to identify the costs associated with getting a loan. There are costs involved, obviously. Fifth, you're going to be able to identify the factors that lenders use to make loan decisions, whether you get a loan or not. Next, uh, we're also going to explain why installment loans cost less than rent-to-own services. We'll talk a little bit about that. Next, we're going to explain why it is important to be wary of rent-to-own, payday loans, and refund anticipation services that typically you get when you do your taxes. And lastly, we're going to de describe how to guard against predatory lending practices. So again, I want to welcome you to the Borrowing Basics module. And sooner or later, of course, almost everyone needs to borrow money. Uh, when used wisely, credit can benefit you and your family. But first, there are some things you should know about the value of credit and the cost. And this course will help you to decide, bottom line, when and how to use credit. All right. Let's get started. All right. Now, I'm sure all of us, or most of us at some point, have borrowed money from a bank, a credit union, or a thrift. And we all have different experiences and as far as what that was like. Now, if you were to ask a financial professional what credit is, which of these would he or she say, do you think? Uh, number one, would they say it's money given to you that you do not have to pay back? Um, probably not. <laughs> Secondly, uh, is it money you borrow to pay for things but must also pay back? And obviously that's what we're going to focus on today. Third, credit could be recognition for a job well done. We all like to get uh, be recognized for when we do a good job and get credit for that. So that's another definition of credit. And finally, it could be the scrolling text at the end of a movie with all the, the credits is exactly as it says. So again, basically today we're going to talk about where it's money you borrow to pay for things but must also pay back, obviously. Okay. Now credit, again, it is the ability to borrow money. And when you do borrow money on credit, you get a loan. Um, now you make a promise to pay them pay back the money you borrowed plus some extra. And the extra amount is part of the cost of borrowing money. This cost is also called interest. If you use credit carefully, obviously it can be useful to you to get the things that you either need or want. Not being careful in the way you use credit, of course, can cause some problems. And the type of credit we're going to talk about today is personal or consumer credit. Credit for business or commercial purposes is not going to be covered in this session today. Of course, any money you borrow must fit into your budget. And remember, we talked about in prior webinars your goal-powered spending. You're developing a budget. So obviously, you know, you want to follow, and you have to make sure that it fits into your budget. Now, you've probably heard the term good credit. What does that mean? Having good credit means that you make your loan payments on time to repay the money that you owe. 
if you have a good credit record, obviously it's going to be easier to borrow money in the future. However, if you do have problems using credit responsibly, obviously then it's going to be harder to borrow money in the future. Okay, so why is this thing called credit important? Uh, credit is important because, number one, it is convenient when you do not have the cash to make a purchase. Secondly, it's useful in times of emergencies. Third, it allows you to pay for purchases over time, especially large purchases like a car or a home. And, of course, it can affect your ability to obtain employment, housing, and insurance depending upon how well you manage it. Okay, next we're going to talk a little bit about collateral. You've heard that term. What is collateral? Well, collateral is often is a loan often secured uh, by collateral or a guarantee. Uh, lenders take a risk to lend you money, obviously. Therefore, they want to make sure that their money is secure. Now, security or an asset or assets you pledge to the lender is basically the definition of collateral. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. All right, um, a guarantee is a form of collateral. For example, an example of a guarantee would be co-signing. It's a form of guaranteeing a loan. Uh, if a person with no credit history asks another person to co-sign a loan, then the co-signer is equally responsible and has to pay if the borrower defaults. And just a personal observation, and you know, you might hear, should I or should I not co-sign? Obviously, each situation is different, but to be honest with you, it's never a good idea to co-sign for a loan for somebody. Um, uh, they always suggest against it, if at all possible. All right. And finally, in a secured loan, the borrower offers collateral for a loan. Um, and a secured loan, obviously, again, which a borrower offers collateral for the borrowed money. And uh, if, the, if it's not paid back, then obviously the lender will take back the collateral or whatever the property is that you put up against the loan. All right, so that's a secured loan. We've talked about a guarantee. An unsecured loan is a loan that is not secured by collateral, obviously. It, they, they look at your credit report. They look at your good faith. A signature loan might be another name for an unsecured loan. And then what is an asset? An asset is something obviously valuable that you own. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about the different types of loans. We're going to start with the first one, which is a consumer installment loan. Now, a consumer installment loan basically is used to pay for personal expenses for you and your family. Some examples of an installment loan might be an auto loan where the automobile you are purchasing is used as collateral for the loans. Unse there might be other unsecured loans for short-term short -term needs, excuse me, such as buying a computer. Okay, I, As an example, I got a short-term loan years ago. Uh, my, I had four kids go into braces at the same time. I didn't have all that money to put. Braces are expensive. Uh, they were all about the same age. So I took out a short-term unsecured loan for the braces. Um, and, and that could be another example, perhaps, of what a short-term loan is. It's not secure. Uh, if I didn't pay the loan, hopefully they wouldn't come and, and take the, the braces out of my kid's mouth, but it's, it's an unsecured loan. So anyway, all righty. The next thing we're going to talk about, then, is credit cards. Now, credit cards give you the ongoing ability to borrow money for household, family, and other personal expenses. Having a credit card allows you to buy things without actually having the money there right away, obviously. Remember that if you're not careful in spending, you can get into big trouble. You could be burdened with debt. You need to be sure you're able to make at least the minimum monthly payment on your credit card bill. All right. The next type of loan we're going to talk about is very important. Most people in their lifetime, they want to buy a home. So we're going to talk about home loans. And there are three main types of home loans. The first one is a home purchase loan. And obviously that's made for the pur purpose of buying a home. And it is secured by the home that you're buying as collateral. If you don't make the payments, 
they can foreclose on the home and take the property back. A second type of a home loan is a home refinance loan. And that is a, a loan that replaces an existing home loan by paying it in full and replacing it with a new home loan. A cash out refinance loan allows you to borrow more money than owed on the loan to be replaced. And homeowners often refinance their homeowners home loans for a lower interest rate or maybe uh, with a cash out to obtain money for home repairs or other personal needs as well. And then lastly, we have a home equity loan. Now, home equity loan allows you to borrow money that is secured by your home. Of course, equity, it, it's also considered maybe a second mortgage or a loan, again, secured by your home. Now, home equity loans allow you to borrow money that, again, that is secured by your, your home. Don't mean to sound like a broken record. Equity is the value of the home minus the debt or what you owe on the home loan. So example, as the example says on your screen, if the value of the home is 250000 you owe still 200000 on the home, your equity is $50,000 in the home. All right. Uh, a lender may allow you to borrow up to a certain percentage of your home's value, generally up to 80%, as it states. And these loans can be typically used for any reason. Remember, again, I can't stress enough, any type of home loan you obtain is secured by your house. And if any home loan is not repaid, you could lose your home. Okay. All right. Now that we've talked about the different types of loans, unsecured, secured, we talked about collateral, things like that. The next thing we're going to typically we're going to talk about is the cost of credit. Because right? obviously when you get a loan, there are generally, you know, there are going to be costs involved. And there are generally two costs you must pay fees, and interest. Fees are charged by your financial institution for activities such as reviewing your loan application, servicing your account, things like that. Uh, a credit card company might charge you, for example, an annual maintenance fee of $30, a service fee when you get a cash advance, or a penalty fee for charging over your credit limit, or also known as commonly as an over-the-limit fee. A lender might also charge a $30 late fee when you don't pay your bill on time. And we've talked in prior sessions about always try to pay five days ahead of your due date. Put it on your calendar, remember, as part of your GPS system. All right, the second type of is a second affiliated cost of credit is interest. Now, interest is the amount of money a financial institution charges for allowing you to use its money. The interest rate can be either fixed or variable, or either one. Now, fixed rates stay the same throughout the term of the loan, um, except in the case of credit cards, where the rate may be changed if the bank gives you the required notice. Variable rates might change during the loan term. The loan agreement will show the details of the rate changes. All right. There's a very important act called the Truth in Lending Act. And this was passed, uh, and basically what it says is that the requires the banks to disclose any charges so you can compare the actual cost of borrowing. And lenders must disclose the amount financed, the APR, the finance charges, and the total payment. Okay? All right, let's talk about it again. Obviously, the amount financed is the amount of the loan the lender is letting you borrow. For example, $5,000 for one year. The annual percentage rate is the cost of your loan expressed as a yearly percentage, such as 12%. The APR reflects the total cost of lending rather than just the interest charge. It is the primary tool that you should use to compare lending options. The law generally requires that APR must easily be seen on credit card applications. Okay. The penalty APR is different. That is the APR charged on new credit card transactions if you trigger the penalty terms in your credit card contract. Your credit card issuer may consider you in default if you pay late, if you go over your credit limit, or if your check is returned. And if you become more than 60 days late, the penalty ABR, APR may be applied to your existing balance. All right. Now, finance charges. Next. They are the total dollar amount the loan will cost you. 
They include items such as interest, service charge, and loan fees. For example, the finance charge total is 12% of $5,000 or $600. And then the total payment, of course, is the amount you will have paid after making all the scheduled payments. Using the $5,000 loan as an example, the total payment, including the original amount borrowed, plus the interest is $5,600. Here the loan is for one year, but if the length of the loan is longer, the monthly payments, of course, would be lower. However, you will end up paying more interest in the end. Okay, so that's all the different costs we, about credit, and we're going to go ahead and move on. And we're going to talk about rent-to-own services. All right. Now, getting credit is not cheap. However, getting a bank loan is usually less expensive than the following alternatives. And again, rent-to-own services, what they do is they let you use an item for a period of time, whether it be furniture or whatever it might be, by making monthly or weekly payments. If you want to purchase the item, your rental payments will be partly credited toward the purchase price. The store will set up a plan for you to rent them, to rent the item until you pay enough to own it. If you choose not to purchase the item, you would simply be renting the item to be returned at the end of the rental period. The store is the legal owner of the item until you make the final payment. If you miss a payment, the store can come and take the item back. If this happens, you will not own the item, obviously, and you won't get your money back. Now, rent-to-own agreements are technically not loans, so no interest is charged. However, the difference between the cash price, if you were to buy the item outright that day, and your total payment, the total of all your rental payments over time, is like the interest you pay on a loan. Now, generally, rent-to-own services are more expensive, sometimes much more expensive, than getting a consumer installment loan to buy the item. So that's always, if you're going to do that, the better option. Okay, talk about a second type payday loan services. Now these are short-term loans, typically up to two weeks. What you typically do is you write a post-dated check and you receive cash that day. The loan service cashes the check on your payday to pay the loan in full then. You can also go into the loan office and pay your loan with cash, at which point the lender returns your unused or uncashed check to you. You must be careful of payday loans, though. They are usually made to people who need money right away and plan to pay it back within their next paycheck. However, if you're unable or unwilling to repay the loan when it is due, many people pay more fees to get another payday loan. They just keep renewing it and renewing it, and that's where you have to be careful and stay away from. Payday loans can be much more costly than they appear at first glance. Again, if you don't have the money to pay the loan with the agreed upon time period, the lender may renew the loan and charge you additional fees. This will increase the total amount that you owe them. Let's look at an example, as it shows there, of a loan amount of $200. Let's say you go to a payday lender and you borrow $200. Uh, the loan term is two weeks. The, AP, uh, the fee is $30. And so you write a check for $230, let's say. The APR estimate for this transaction, based on that, is 391%. Unbelievable, 391%. Take a minute and let that sink in. An APR for a typical payday loan may vary and may even be higher than this example. Most payday lenders, number one, allow you to roll over or renew your loan. Two, they can charge an additional fee for renewal, this time for $260, to $30 plus the $30 additional fee. And thirdly, they are usually not federally insured financial institutions or they're not closely monitored by the government as banks are. You should ask your bank or credit union for other available options if you need cash in a hurry. All right, so again, uh, they're not typically a very wise idea. All right, let's change gears and let's talk about a refund anticipation loan. These are short-term loans typically secured by your income tax refund. Although the business preparing your income tax return will give you the money, you are actually receiving a loan from a bank or a finance company. Now, you may not realize 
how much this loan is really costing you because you do not have to pay any fees associated with obtaining a refund anticipation loan at the time you receive the money. For example, your refund, let's say, is $1,500 on your taxes. The fees associated with filing your income tax return with the tax preparation service and getting the refund anticipation loan equal $300. You will receive a check for $1,200, but you're actually paying $300 in fees to obtain your income tax refund. It is important to remember that the paperwork you sign to receive a refund anticipation loan will legally obligate you to repay a $1,500 loan. So if your actual refund is only $800, you are responsible for paying, repaying $700 plus interest to the lender that made the refund anticipation loan. And the higher the loan amount, the higher the refund anticipation loan fee will be. And here are some typical costs affiliated with a refund anticipation loan. You have a tax preparation fee of $100, typically. You have a refund anticipation fee of $75, an electronic filing fee of $40, and document creation of $33. So a total is $248, okay? When you electronically file, or e-file, as it's commonly called, your tax return and request direct deposit, your refund is often deposited in your bank account within two weeks. Sometimes refund anticipation loans take just as long, yet cost you substantially more money, okay? So again, typically, why not just file your return electronically, direct deposit in your bank account? It'll take about the same amount of time, typically. And you don't have to pay all those extra fees. Many organizations, to kind of wrap up on this topic, host volunteer income tax assistance sites. VITA, V-I-T-A, for short. VITA is an internal revenue service coordinated program that provides free income tax assistance and e-filing. Income eligibility restrictions may apply. Contact the IRS for a location near you. All right. Moving on. What happens when you need money fast? Okay. All right. Let's say it's two weeks until payday. Your credit cards are maxed out and your car breaks down. Um, you, need, you only need a few hundred dollars for the repair, but you need it now. Where can you get the money? Okay, here's some ideas. Borrow from yourself first. Okay, try that. Uh, put money into an emergency savings account for unforeseen expenses. You might even link this savings account to your checking account to protect yourself if you were to ever overdraw your checking account. Uh, if saving money seems impossible to you, consider just making small, simple changes in your habits or banking practices. Possibilities including having your paycheck directly deposited into your checking account with a portion automatically placed into an emergency savings account. Can you think of, you know, there are several other ways you can save and build an emergency fund. Also, comparison shop when you're going for a loan. Again, by looking at the total dollar cost and the APR. Payday lenders, for example, again, typically charge about $15 for every $100 borrowed. So on a $500 loan for two weeks, you would pay $75 in interest. That might not sound like a lot of money to pay for a small loan, but again, it translates to a whopping 391% APR. And also check out some emergency cash options with your bank as well, some things that you might be able to do. Okay. We've talked a lot about getting credit and the cost of credit and some options when you need cash for you know, those unexpected emergencies. Now we're going to talk about how credit decisions are made. What does the lender look at when they're determining whether they're going to issue, whether you're a good risk or a bad risk? Now they, we call them the four C's, as you can see. There are four C's. Capacity refers to your present and your future ability to meet your payments. Second, capital refers to the value of your assets. Remember, we talked about what your assets were, what you own, and your net worth. Character refers to how you have paid your bills or debts in the past, your payment history. 
And the fourth C, collateral, is again, refers to property or assets offered to secure the loan. So let's, let's, let's discuss capacity first. The lender may consider such things as number one, how long have you been in your job? Generally, obviously, a lender would like to see that you've held the same job or same type of job for at least a year. Second, they'll look at your how much money do you make each month? What's your income? And third, what are your monthly expenses? They will compare the amount you owe and your other monthly expenses with your monthly income. Now, this is called debt-to-income ratio. All right, it helps determine how much money you can afford to borrow. Excuse me, I'm sorry. The bank wants to ensure that your expenses are not too high for you to take on the additional monthly debt of a loan payment. They want to make sure that you can repay what they lend. Okay, the second C, capital. For capital, the lender may ask some questions. Number one, how much money do you have in your checking or savings account? They want to know if you can manage your money well enough to take out a loan. Second, do you own a house? Home ownership means that you have equity or secured savings in case you cannot pay your mortgage. Do you have investments or other assets? Uh, example, a car. Lenders want to determine the value of your assets. They will also compare the difference between the value of your assets and the amount of debt you have. This is called net worth. A positive net worth demonstrates your ability, obviously, to manage your money. All right, the third C, character. Regarding your character, the lender may seek answers to the following questions. Have you had credit in the past? If you have a good credit history of repaying your other loans, you'll have an easier time getting your loan request approved, of course. How many credit accounts do you have? If you've never had a credit account, you might have difficulty getting approved for a loan. Having a good credit history shows a lender that you can borrow money responsibly. Some lenders let you prove this without credit history. For example, they might ask for proof that you pay your rent and your utility and phone bills on time, or that you make regular deposits to a savings account. Other ways to show a creditor that you're at good credit risk may include insurance premium payments on time, payments of medical bills, payments for school tuition, child care payments, payments of personal loans documented by a written loan agreement and canceled check. Ask the lender to consider alternative forms of history. If a lender is not willing to do this, shop around for one who will. Also, have you ever filed for bankruptcy? A lender will want to know. Do you have, have you had any outstanding judgments? Have you had property repossessed or foreclosed upon? Have you made late payments? Now, these situations may make it more difficult for you to get approved for a loan, However, some lenders will just ask, ask you to explain what happened. And depending upon your circumstances, a lender might be willing to approve your loan request. Situations that might prevent you from getting a loan at all, um, if you are currently going through them, include an attachment, which is a lien against personal property. A bankruptcy, which of course is a legal declaration of insolvency. Bankruptcy will not fix credit record problems and will be part of your credit history for 10 years. You must get credit counseling before you file for bankruptcy. By the way, Community Credit Counselors offers that. And the law also requires you to pay a portion of your unsecured debt if possible. Another thing, a foreclosure. Obviously, that's a legal proceeding initiated by a creditor to take possession of collateral that secured a defaulted loan. We typically think of a foreclosure dealing with a home. A garnishment, uh, you know, if you've had a garnishment, that's a process by which the lender obtains directly from a third party, such most commonly an employer, part of an employee's salary to satisfy an unpaid debt. Part of the employee's salary is taken each pay period until the debt is fully paid, and this process must be authorized by a court order. Also, a judgment might prevent you. A court or a judgment is just a court order requiring a debtor to pay money to the creditor. The judgment places a security lien on the debtor's property until the judgment is satisfied. In other words, the debt is repaid. Another one, a lien, a creditor's claim against property to secure repayment of a debt. Or finally, a repossession, seizure of collateral that secured a loan in default. Typically, we think of that as your automobile. All right. Now, 
Banks will use credit reports to obtain character information. And you can obtain free annual credit reports by doing one of the following. And very important information on your screen there. Um, you can go to www.annualcreditreport.com once a year and get a free copy of your credit report from each one of the three bureaus. Uh, or you can call, if you don't have internet access, you can call 1-877-322-8228, go through a simple verification process over the phone, and they will also mail you a copy of your credit report. Or you can complete the credit report request form, um, or you can, you know, and re or request it through the Annual Credit Report Request Service, P.O. Box, 105281 Atlanta, Georgia, 30348-5281. There are all different ways that you can get it. Uh, some people, you can, they, they prefer to download their credit report from each one of the three bureaus all at once, and that's fine, once a year. That way they can compare what's on one versus what's on the other. Sometimes a creditor will report to perhaps one credit bureau, but not to another. Uh, or they can maybe some, I, what I typically do when I go to annual credit report, I personally, I, I pull my one credit report, let's say from Experian. Then four months later, I pull it from Equifax to see what has changed, if anything. And then I, four months later, go to TransUnion and pull it from TransUnion. And you can do that. You can do it either way. Okay? It all depends upon what you're looking for and, and what your preference is but you're entitled to one free credit report from each of the three bureaus once a year through this website, theannualcreditreport.com. Okay. Last C we're going to talk about, collateral. Do you have assets to secure the loan beyond your capacity to pay it off? To determine what collateral you have, again, the lender may ask, you know, um, do you have assets to secure the loan, like we just said, uh, beyond your capacity to pay it off? Uh, maybe your home, uh, maybe a vehicle that's paid for, whatever it might be, furniture, whatever it might be. Now, a co-signer can help you get a loan if you're unable to obtain one yourself. This person signs the loan documents with you and is equally responsible for repaying the loan if you cannot. For example, if you do not have a credit history at all, the lender may require you to use a cosigner to get a loan. Uh, and again, we've already talked about the benefits of being a cosigner on a loan or the, you know, try not to do it if you can at all do it, but sometimes, you know, you have to. All right. Last thing we're going to talk about here is talking about being on guard against predatory lending practices. Now, what do we mean by that? Predatory lending occurs when companies offer loan products using certain marketing tactics, abusive collection tactics, and loan terms that deceive or exploit borrowers. Predatory loans are usually much more expensive than other loans or have repayment terms that many people just can't meet. The best way to guard against being involved in a predatory loan transaction is to be a good consumer by doing the following. Number one, only deal with reputable loan providers. Second, shopping around with several loan providers of your choice to obtain the best terms. Third, reading and understanding all the terms and conditions of an offer loan or asking questions until you are sure that you understand the terms. Don't sign anything unless you understand the terms. And fourth, ensuring that you can afford and make the payments according to the loan terms. So again, you have to make sure, bottom line, that it fits into your budget. Okay. Kind of review what we learned about. We're at the end. And I told you it would be less than an hour. All right. We learned today about what credit is, different types of credit, and what good credit means. We talked about secured and unsecured loans. We talked about the different types of loans, home loans, credit cards. We talked about the cost of credit and using non-loan services. We talked about the four C's, how lenders make credit decisions. And we talked about predatory lending practices, and obviously you want to be aware of those. All right. If you have any questions at any time, you can feel free to email either one of us, either uh, Paul Usowitz at bankruptcyinfo.org, that's my email, 
or you can email jane.miles at communitycreditcounselors.org. Or if you have any feedback on this session, we certainly appreciate you joining us today. Um, and we hope you'll join us for our next webinar, which will be held in September. We will send you the next, uh, we'll email out the title of that and the exact date shortly. But certainly we thank you for joining us today. We hope you've learned something. And again, if you have any other questions at any time, feel free to give us a call. And don't forget, check us out on Facebook. At, at uh, Facebook, just do a search for Community Credit Counselors. All right. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Have a half and safe, safe Labor Day. And we'll talk to you next month. Have a great day. Bye-bye.